wants yeah. to play games. Yeah. All right, so we are a little behind because we had a completely unnecessary snow day. They canceled class last Thursday, in spite of the fact that like the roads were like completely fine. I think they did it because there was supposed to be more snow, and of course, we can't ever get the forecast right in Oklahoma because it's Oklahoma and the weather changes constantly. So they, they based their canceling the morning classes last Thursday on the fact that there was supposed to be more snow on Wednesday night, and that never happened, and so the roads were perfectly fine, but they had already put it out there on the news and on our alerts that I get 15 times a day that we didn't have any class. So we're a little bit behind. We get caught up in the <coughs> marching to Atlanta. We need to talk about your answers to the critical thinking challenges. So this gives you an opportunity to sell the class and your idea. Remember, this is a sales class. So present things in a way that you're selling yourself, your ideas to the class and to me. I have randomly selected by lot the order of go for today's um, discussion. We'll start with the chosen, followed by erasable ink. The third will be the back table, and then the fourth presenting presentation presentation. If I can talk today, will be the ridiculous sex. So, the chosen. You all go on up, and let's talk about your answers to what is justice, and what does justice have to do with marketing? So. All right, so we've got one person that's not in the screen. Let me see if I can adjust this. There we go. All right, go ahead. Justice, I believe, is another word for satisfaction to me. Um, Getting what you want is justice, like giving the people what they want, that's really justice. And what it has to do with marketing, I believe justice deals with uh, ethically getting customer satisfaction, good quality, uh, communicative justice, and then uh, social justice. Okay, so what was your first example again? Uh, equality. Equality. Okay. <laughs> All right. What was your second one? So uh, like communicated. Okay. And social. And social. Yeah. All right. And uh, whenever we were talking about like uh, the equality part of justice, um, it made us think of kind of like in the form of like a car salesman. Like when someone walks in, you don't really judge them based on what their appearance is. Uh, necessarily give them every person that's coming in the same opportunity um, to make a sale for that individual. Okay. All right. Um, I think like piggybacking that, just um, the equality of marketing to everyone and having letting everyone have an equal chance to see what you have to offer and uh, not just targeting one group. And then with communicative justice, this deals with giving customers what they're entitled to, giving them what they're entitled to through the price system. Um, according to the price system, I'm letting them know what they're getting, worth their money, and what their value would be. Okay. And for social, this is dealing with the distribution of wealth, um, opportunities and privileges within society. So most of like the demand is in upgrade society like Edmund. So a lot of people want to upgrade things around other places like around Oklahoma, you're not selling the same stuff. So that's the social value. 
Okay. So what I think you're saying, you can correct me, is that you seem to think that justice is what we might call the desserts theory of justice. This is a this is a a um, this is a theory that came about. It's difficult to, to deal with. Uh, you see it in Republic, the desserts theory of justice, giving people what they're due. If, if I pay for something, I should get what you say. If, if you say that this phone will operate with, for example, you know, all platforms, it will integrate all platforms. So, for example, everyone in here, I think, when I asked before has the Apple iPhone, right? Does anybody have something other than the iPhone? <laughs> oh, it must have been my other class. <laughs> Three of you are deciding that you're not going to march to the beat of the drum. You're going to create your own way. Why is it that you don't have an Apple iPhone? I hate Apple. Um, yes, I don't like it. Not like Galaxy. At least with Google. I prefer it. Really? Yeah. It's just one. I, you know, when they came out with the whole, like, you can share by bumping your phone, the galaxies came out with, you can share. I had friends that went out and bought that, and I was like, I want to see this. I want to, you know, and it didn't work. I mean, isn't that, that's a lie, or it doesn't work perfectly or something. If I have it. Phones ever die, I can literally put my phone over and charge my headphones. my phone. Another thing that I've used that charger. you're kind of talking about is uh -huh. from old phone uh -huh. data to new phone data. So you basically put back and back and it transfers everything over. Okay. I thought you were talking about the battery. So it was in, didn't they advertise like, let's say like you need a battery? It was before I, It was before they had the wireless charging capabilities. The Galaxy, I can't remember which one it was, that came up with this idea that you could like share your playlist by basically putting <laughs> your phones together. And what um, you're talking about is share. Yeah, I, never, I don't even know that. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Didn't work. Um, at least not in that first generation, it, but it didn't work well. So that's an example of communication. I get that. It's, you know, being honest and truthful in your communication, I think that's understandable. And then uh, when you talk about social, you talked about the distribution um, and demand. Okay, I think those are all good examples. We'll talk about this. Is there ever a time when giving people what they want is maybe not the best thing, though? Is there a difference between most preferred and preferred by most? So let's think about how many of you, when you were a little kid, got all your vaccines. There's a whole bunch of people out there that are anti-vacciners, right? They don't want, they don't think that you should vaccinate your kid because it might lead them to getting, I don't know, autism. They, they speculate uh, without any basis in reality, by the way. <laughs> that that uh, vaccinations lead to autism in children. That, no evidence for that whatsoever. But um, there is evidence. One of the things that they do argue is that you know if you vaccinate your kid, um, they might die. Well, there's a certain number of people that any drug that you give them, you know, I mean, there's a risk. There's an inherent risk uh, that they that they may that they may not make it through. Right. And so, but. Um, if you ask little kids, if you took a whole group of little kids and said, for those of you who remember getting vaccinated, I remember I had a horrible fear of shots. How many of you have horrible fear? They had to hold me down to give me the vaccinations because I was like like throwing myself off. I was like a little pinball bouncing all over the doctor's office mm -hmm. trying to escape because um, I did not want to be shot, right? But why is it that, that they argued that you need these vaccines? It's not just for you, is it? Mm -hmm. It's also for what? Sheep, uh, like sheep, or uh, herd immunity. Yeah, it's also for everyone else that you're going to go to school with, so that you're not giving them, you know, the dreaded diseases. But if you ask kids what they wanted, that nobody wants to get shots, do they? No. I, I know very few people who just love needles. <laughs> And just want to be stabbed and poked. <laughs> Almost no one. But there's a difference between most preferred and preferred by most. So we, that's one of the things that we have to think about. It's hard to come up with an, an answer in which getting people what they want doesn't seem to be 
the right thing, but I think we can find examples. Do, should we, um, if we, if we took that to its extremes, we'll make an argument ad absurdum here. If people want heroin, should they be able to get that? Our views are evolving, by the way, on this topic. On drugs, at least. I mean, we, we now we now have a major presidential candidate who is willing to say that yes, we should decriminalize all drugs. We have one major political candidate, I think, if I remember correctly from the last debate, which I did watch, but I started to lapse in and out of consciousness the the tenth time they were saying the same thing over and over again. I think Pete Buttigieg is the one who says we ought to decriminalize everything. Because we have a whole lot of people that are in prison as a result of this. I mean, we, we've experienced this in Oklahoma. Uh, we went to medical marijuana and then we decriminalized it. Now they're going back and they're letting a whole lot of people out of jail that were in jail for small amounts of marijuana, right? And and they they upcharge the way, and I can tell you this as a, as a practicing attorney, the way the law worked before we had medical marijuana is you would always charge people with the, the highest amount of crime that you thought you could reasonably get away with in order to, if they got an attorney, to plea that down to the charge that they may actually be guilty of, right? So, for example, I had numbers of clients who, because they're potheads, had more than one baggie on them. Why did they have more than one baggie on them? Well, according to the law, the presumption is if you have more than one baggie, it's possession with intent to distribute. That's the law, or that was the law, right? Mm -hmm. Why did they actually have more than one baggie mm -hmm. on them usually? Well, sure. not necessarily. Most of my clients were high and couldn't remember, you know, <laughs> or they had, they, they had one dime bag, and why is it called a dime bag? No. It costs 10 bucks, right? A dime bag is 10 bucks. They had one dime bag and they were almost through with it, so they bought another dime bag from their dealer, right? Well, now they've got two dime bags on, one that's, you know, three quarters of the way gone or gone, but may have residue of marijuana in it. And the DA will always charge them with possession with intent to distribute. Why is it they charge them with possession with intent to distribute in those circumstances? Well, because what they want to get them on is possession, and they want them to go to they, they Prosecutors think that people need to go to jail. That's just their, their, they think everybody needs to go to jail, right? Well, that's crazy. And we have a lot of people who couldn't afford attorneys or couldn't afford good attorneys, and they ended up, because they had two dime bags on them, in jail serving five, seven, ten year sentences. And that's a horrible waste of resources, isn't it? Yeah. But I don't know, should we legalize, you know, given that, should we legalize her heroin? No, not heroin. That's that's too much. <laughs> Math? No. <laughs> How about cocaine? I don't know. Oh, I'm going to equivocate on cocaine. <laughs> All right. Okay, good job. Erasable ink. Yeah. <laughs> Is the head in the way? No. But your head is at the side, it's just not. I'm not in the show. Okay, so justice is for you all.
Okay, we found the definition. So one of the definitions of justice uh, is just behavior or treatment. Justice has to do with marketing because to be an ethical salesperson, you have to develop honest relationships with your customers. Okay. And then one of the examples we put out was the um, from the movie Matilda, where the dad sells like cars, but like it's like cars that's already what is it called? Yeah, and like it's not in a great condition, and he's like still selling it. Has like four hundred thousand hours on it. Yeah. Oh yeah, the drill. Yeah. Yeah. He like lose the bumper on that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Okay, so let's 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 talk about that. So justice is what did you say? Fair treatment? Is that what you said? Just behavior or or treatments. Or treatment. Mm -hmm. What kind of treatment? You mean just treatment? Probably fair treatment. You think it's fair treatment? What's fair? Don't want to put words in your mouth. If you think it's just Honest. treatment, I, if you think it's just treatment, let's go with that. So if I decide just because I don't like you because you're wearing a one love Costa Rica, <laughs> you know, t-shirt, um, and I think that's just sort of morally offensive. So I decided I'm going to treat you with, uh, I'm going to give you an F. I'm treating you, aren't I? Some way. I'm doing something to you. I mean, it's just behavior. Just. It's not just treatment. Okay, well, you can't use just as the definition. That's that's circular reasoning. That's that's begging the question, right? Uh, to, to rely on the thing itself as the definition is, is petito principe or, um, or circular reasoning or begging the question. So what kind of treatment is it? Well, let's go with, since I put words in your mouth, let's go with fair treatment. Okay. What's fair? Probably not that. But, uh, I don't know. Uh, if I said, you know, your your t-shirt like is, is like not worthy of a business student, you should dress, you know, you all are business students. You want to go into business, you should look like me. You should dress like I dress. Can't afford that. <laughs> yeah. Aristotic band, right? What? Like an aristocratic vampire? Uh, well, I mean, at least, you know, when my mother went to college, women couldn't wear pants. I mean, they had to wear a dress. Or they had to wear a skirt and a, and a blouse. And a, men had to wear um, a button-down shirt and chinos, at least. Ankle skirts, probably. What? Ankle skirts, probably. No, it didn't have to be ankle. She went to a Catholic, even though she's Jewish, she went to a Catholic university. Um, it had to be below the knee. That was, it could not, but it didn't have to be. I mean, they weren't Pentecostal, so, you know, <laughs> but um, it did have to be below the knee, and it, you had to wear a blouse that, that was buttoned down. You know, men had to wear button down shirts. Um, so maybe by giving you an F, you'll learn not to, to wear One Love Costa Rica t shirt to my class. What? I would not learn. You would not learn? Well, then maybe you're a candidate for natural deselection, right? <laughs> okay. So let's talk about fair treatment. Why don't you think it's fair of me to give you an F for wearing that T-shirt or Star Wars? I, I can't stand Star Wars. I went, you know, I, <laughs> I went to the I went to Disneyland the last uh, um, semester with my students. Uh, we go every year for a competition and. and the new big thing at Disneyland, or actually at, at Disney Studios, was the Star Wars, and I was forced to stand in line for a, a, just a Ford ride. Yeah, I mean, it was not great, in, in my opinion. I love all things Disney, but that was that was not one of the things that I love. So you're wearing Star Wars, like, mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't like Star Wars. Maybe I should give you an app. So why is that not fair? Well, just like you don't like it, I still like it. It's not based as whether you can pass the materials in a class. Okay. All right. So there has to be something tied to the the. There has to be some connection between the the reason I'm doing something and 
the uh, the behavior. Is that what you're saying? There's no connection between that. Okay, so there's no nexus between T-shirts or Star Wars hoodies. Um, by the way, I don't really hate Star Wars. I just, yeah. I, mean, I don't really understand them. I don't get them the way some people do, but I, I'm not obsessive about it. I have watched the movies. You know, they're moderately entertaining, but I'm, I'm not like, you know, running out to be the first one to, to watch the, the, the show in the theater or whatever. Um, so there has to be some connection. There doesn't there doesn't seem to be much connection between Star Wars, a hatred of Star Wars studies, or one love t-shirts, and the grade in this class. Is that what you're telling me? Correct. Okay. All right. So in the movie Matilda, let's go with your next example. Uh, the father uses he's a car he used car salesperson. Uh, is that really unethical? Well, it's not unethical to be a car salesperson, but the way he like fixes the car. What do you mean by the way he fixes the car is unethical? It's a, pretty much a lemon lot. So okay. all the cars have a lot of problems. But so he there are some people that can't afford more than that. So he's providing a need, isn't he? At a high mark for a car that doesn't work. Like, as soon as you drive it off the lot, it pretty much dies. Yeah, but I mean, that's what a used car is, isn't it? Mm. It's to drive it a mile down the road for your car to die. If you just paid a couple thousand dollars for it, no big deal. Okay. Because he knows it's a bad car. Uh, if you're paying a couple thousand, now what's the average price of a car? It's over thirty-five thousand dollars, by the way. I think it's closer to forty now. If you take the so, if you're paying a couple thousand dollars for a car, shouldn't you? I mean, sh let the buyer beware. Shouldn't you be aware that that's not going to be like the most reliable transportation on the planet? Yes, but you would expect it to get you farther than to the McDonald's. A mile? Okay. All right. <laughs> so it's a matter of degree. All right. I get that. What's your second example? Um, second example is online prescriptions. Uh, I had a, a antivirus subscription I was mm -hmm. subscribed to. I thought I was paying a one-time fee, but it was like a reoccurring fee. It was kind of hidden in the fine print. Okay. So the evergreen... Um, clauses. Why is it called an evergreen clause, would you imagine? <laughs> What's an evergreen tree? It's, never... it's green all year round. It's green all year round, right? So evergreen clauses, they put them in there because basically they, they're constantly recurring, right? And they don't, they don't expire. You have to let them know before the expiration of the term that you don't want to renew, otherwise it automatically renews for the same period, right? So if you had a, a year subscription, it's gonna renew. If it's a month to month, it renews every, it becomes evergreen, ever at the end of every month. And you think there's a problem with that? If it's not explicitly stated. You should have read the terms, right? Shouldn't you? Like, read through all the terms. Don't just be clicking. I know you just click, 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 so that you can play Angry Birds or whatever it is that you, you know, read the terms, people. Is that unfair? No, 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 like, read. Isn't that, what, isn't that what a lawyer is going to tell you read, before you sign something, before you agree to it? You need to read the contract. And why don't you do that? It's tedious. So? That seems like that's on you, not on the company. You clicked on I accept these terms and conditions, right? All right, so what's your third one? Amazon. Amazon. Guarantees same day shipping. Okay. And what what about that is problematic? <coughs> or is it not problematic? Are you saying that's a great example? That's you think a it's a good example? Oh, it's a good example. Amazon's. It's a good example because customers can get their products that same day. 
if they need it that day, they don't have to worry about not getting it that day. Okay, so they're they are fulfilling a need and they're giving the customer what it wants at what cost though? Literally, people are peeing in bottles in Amazon warehouses because if they take a break, they may not hit their number and they have a forced distribution and people get fired. If you're in the bottom 10%, every wow. every quarter, I think it's every quarter, they do a forced distribution and everybody who's in the bottom 10% is fired. So people are, are literally not going to the bathroom. They're, they're going in bottles in order to be able to meet that kind of logistical distribution. Is that ethical? <laughs> No. Yes. <laughs> no. no. Okay. Why not? Um, because we shouldn't be able to go to the bathroom, not be in a bottle. And well, you you signed up for that, didn't you? I mean, you know what the rules are. Right, but you want to ex you want to think that the employees would have to do like well, go through all that trouble just to get your package out that same day. Okay. So maybe that's not ethical because they're having to treat people poorly. They're, they're having to treat the associates poorly to mm -hmm. make the customer happy. Right. So there's a lot of pain going on there. <coughs> the customer but, doesn't see that, so. But should they? Should they think about that? Yes. I mean, your generation actually is one of the generations that does think of, I mean, most of us want Cheap, cheap goods. Um, you want that one love t-shirt. How was that manufactured? It wasn't manufactured by somebody making seven twenty-five an hour or whatever the minimum. What is the minimum wage now? It's still seven twenty-five. Yeah, seven twenty-five. Am I right on that? Wow, I, I thought you know it's seven twenty-five, but most people, most places pay more than that. But the minimum wage, I can guarantee you that the person making that shirt didn't get the equivalent of seven twenty-five an hour. Right, that's usually made in piecemeal shops where they're paid by the item and you know i mean you know three or four cents per per shirt or whatever in some sweatshop in taiwan or, or communist china or someplace else should we think about that yeah i mean what you want that t-shirt god only knows why but uh you know i mean i want my um my <laughs> shoes are not a good example because they're meaning Allen Evans are all manufactured in the United States, so they have to pay their workers well. But most most shoes are manufactured in sweatshop conditions. And do we really care? Do we think about that when we buy them? The evidence suggests your generation does, which is why people are looking at things like the sourcing of materials and looking at companies who provide stuff. So Tom's is a good example. What does Tom's do? They, buy a pair of they give a pair away. Yeah. Right? It's one for one. Okay. All right. So fair treatment. We're going to have to think about what is fair. But those are good questions. So that's a good start. Very good. Anything else that you all want to add to that? In conclusion, to be a successful ethical salesperson, it is key to develop honest relationships with customers. Okay. So honesty. You have this idea of honesty. Um, is it ever okay to lie to people? Never? <clears throat> really never okay to lie yeah. all right uh, we'll, we'll talk about that i would generally agree with that it's not but um i'm not sure that uh jeremy bentham would agree with you so we'll we'll think some more about that all right good job the back table Okay, everybody's in the shot. Good deal. So for you all, justice is what? Um, marketing is a social activity which can affect a multitude of aspects of the social environment. 
Therefore, marketing must be just and ethical, and any company that is not just and ethical is not likely to succeed. Sorry. Um, justice is defined as just behavior and treatment being ethical and lawful in your behavior. So the law is important, right? Is that what you're saying? In the scope of marketing. Mm -hmm. All right. So the law is something that we should think about. Currently, it's not legal to market cocaine, <coughs> but maybe we should think about that. What about if the law changes? Does that make an impact on it? I mean, for a long time, we thought that marijuana was was the root of all evil, and now we've decided that it's hey, it's medical, it's medicinal, it's of the earth. We should we should allow you to use it if you have you know anxiety or if you can't sleep or we have. By the way, the most liberal medical marijuana law of any of the medical marijuana states. So um, we're not as liberal as like Colorado, which has recreational pot, right? But uh, we do have a liberal uh, medical. So you can get it for almost anything. All you have to say is I can't sleep or I have anxiety. You know, I mean, the states, the other states that have medical marijuana limit it to things like cancer patients, right? They, they limit it to uh, like a handful of conditions, not, not necessarily anything and everything. So what does that mean that the law changes if we think about the law? Society is an ever-evolving phenomenon. So in order to be constantly developing, so you can figure out one thing didn't work or one thing might not have been as ethical as you thought it was. So it keeps developing but within the scope of marketing. Um, as long as you're following the law and you follow the the substratum uh, ethical conduct that's, that underlies it, then um, you're doing the best you can with what you got. So, okay, all right. So, what are your examples then? All right, so our first example is a bad one. It's uh, the, the company HM put out an advertisement in their catalog depicting an African American boy in HM &M apparel. Uh, the caption was the coolest monkey in the jungle, and actually, this type of inconsideration is unacceptable and did not act just, justly in thinking of the consequences of their advertisement. So, one of the things that we talk about with regard to branding. One of the things that we say with regard to branding is that a good brand should not have any negative connotations and that you should manage your brand such that it doesn't become tarnished. So you're giving this as an example of how they tarnished their brand by having this, what they perceived as being, I, I, I imagine somebody thought was going to be a funny or, you know, entertaining uh, t-shirt and, and it backfired. Okay, I'll buy that. But what about, I think all of us are kind of morally offended by that kind of thing, but business is inherently risky, isn't it? What about the use of, why is it something similar to that along those same lines? You could lose trademark and it's now, it's now very up in the air as to whether or not this will stand. But in the past, you could lose trademark protection if your trademark was perceived as being um, immoral, right? And so, the Native American tribes have gone in and, for example, uh, the Redskins lost trademark protection. Now, I think the Supreme Court has overturned that ruling and, and now they can get their trademark protection back. But the idea is that this is offensive to Native American populations. It used to be that all kinds of things were, were marketed with Native American imagery. Where I went to law school, Oklahoma City University, their, their mascot is the stars. It didn't used to be. It used to be the Chiefs, and they had a very stereotypical um, Native American in full headdress as their mascot. So all kinds of organizations have stopped using those because they realize that they're not ethically sensitive, perhaps, 
Why is it okay though for Florida State? What are the what's Florida State's mascot? Anybody know? So, yeah, why is it okay for them and not for these others? Why have, have they not given up their Seminole mascot? Like in this tradition, was tradition for Oklahoma City University to be the chief? I mean, isn't it? Wouldn't it be make sense in Oklahoma? which is Native America. We have more tribes and more people per capita, more Native Americans per capita than any other history. state. Wouldn't they encourage the Native Americans, maybe? Huh? I guess maybe our history with the Native Americans is not that great. So. But why is it okay for Florida State to use the Civil? I'm not aware of any like group that's caused significant amount of morale to make them want to reconsider that with the Chiefs. I mean, that was a well-known thing. It's a really big deal. Have you ever seen the Florida State mascot come out on? I mean, it is a very stereotypical warrior, Native American warrior look. Why is it that that's okay and the Redskins is not? Or the Oklahoma City Chiefs is not? Well, Redskins is considered like a derogatory term, right? I guess Seminoles is not. But so using the. I'm guessing it was also sort of like um, like warrior culture. Translate that into sports, it's almost like a symbol of honor instead yeah. of something that's insulting. What about Chiefs? I don't think Chiefs is. I think you're right. I think Redskins is derogatory to call to, to say somebody is a Redskin. That that is a, a derogatory term. But what about Chiefs? Like the Oklahoma City Chiefs? That's not derogatory, is it? I mean, Indian some culture the, had some of the Chiefs. culture around the team was considered derogatory, like the. What, what is it? The, the tomahawk or something? Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. That could be considered. Okay. I can see that being considered derogatory, but then the Chiefs, it's almost like an honor. Okay. All right. Um, I can tell you this is an evolving deal because if H&M had done this, I don't think they were around then, but if they had put out a t-shirt like that in the 1950s, do you think they would have had the same backlash that they got today? They, they wouldn't have, have the same backlash. All right, what's your second example? Um, our second example, a simple example is how some, some companies could act unjustly and put out false advertisements about the benefits or side effects of their products. The FDA regulates food products to be accurate and not Okay. So saying something does something. What about, you see this all the time, although they have the disclaimer at the end that nobody listens to, um, Let's let's look at it. Let's look, let's watch an ad. You guys just kind of part for one second. Let me see if I can find his ad. Your brain is an amazing thing, but as you get older, it naturally begins to change, causing a lack of sharpness or even trouble with recall. Thankfully, the breakthrough in Prevagen helps your brain and actually improves memory. The secret is an ingredient originally discovered in jellyfish. In clinical trials, Prevagen has been shown to improve short-term memory. Prevagen, healthier brain, better life. First of all, I just, I find that um, I, I really find that ad fascinating from so many perspectives. Not the least of which is it says Prevagen with a, an ingredient originally found in jellyfish. When I think of super smart, I don't think of jellyfish, right? I mean, if they had said it was an ingredient that originally was found in dolphin brain. Maybe I would think that that was read up because dolphins are really smart, right? 
they, they hypothesize that perhaps dolphins are smarter than we are because they actually use the majority of their brain. We only use a very small percentage of it. So, you know, I mean, if they said, I, I just don't think of jellyfish as being highly intelligent to you. What does that have to do with the yeah? And the green originally is found in jellyfish. Do you think jellyfish and bright? Probably just like sounds and types and like the things that are about your appetite. Okay. All right. Sounds natural and organic. Okay, it sounds natural and organic. Of the earth, <laughs> of the sea, we came from the sea. Maybe. All right. What do you think about that, Adam? False and misleading? Yeah, it's saying like you're having, you're going to have a better life if you yeah, I mean, I, in clinical trials, well, and those are all really hard to really nail down. And if you watch a lot of those ads for anything that's a supplement, they'll say this is not uh, intended to treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Well, memory loss is, is a disease, isn't it? So is that ethical? Okay, I don't know. All right, so false advertising, I, I think that's right. I think, um, do you have a substantive example in your false advertising? Yeah. So like the FDA, they will approve, wasn't it, it, it said, it can say zero sugar and then still have under a gram. And so like it's really unjust for people that are maybe like have an intolerance to like sugar or things or that affect them a lot. And so okay. They can say that there's no sugar. So um, truth in advertising, what the FDA considers truth in advertising is not necessarily. So for people who are extremely diabetic, for example, that can be problematic. So what do they what do they do to get away with that? Most of them, almost everything, by the way, has some sugar in it. I mean, it's it's a really hard uh, substance to get rid of out of all food. I mean, there are very few things. You know, steak, steak doesn't have any sugar, I, I guess, but uh, almost everything else. So what do they say on their advertising that seems to be more truthful? Like on cereal. So cereal are made out of grains. Grains have sugar in them, but there's a difference between Corn flakes, right, which have some sugar, and what? Frosted flakes. Frosted flakes. So what do a lot of people, is it more ethical that they say no added sugar? Does that make it better? Yeah. So you know that there's still sugar, right? And there's a there's carbohydrates the in it, right? As opposed to, you know, being coated with high fructose corn syrup or something like that. Does that make it better? They say not no sugar, but I mean, there are some things that have... As far as I know, I don't think eggs have any sugar in them. I think they're complete protein. Um, steak, I don't think has much or has any sugar, you know, but but most things, if they have any kind of plant base to them, are gonna have what? Sugar. So is it better that we say no added sugar? No processed sugar or okay. along those lines. All right. And your third example? So we actually had a good example. We actually used Tom's. Um, so a good example is uh, how a company can be just considering the global company. A good example of how the, the company can be just in considering the global community is Tom's. Uh, this company can actively practice as a give back mentality. For every pair of shoes consumers buy, Tom Jones company donates a pair of shoes to a child in need. So this sort of justice is what is desirable in the marketing industry. Okay. All right. I think you're right. Although Milton Friedman would say that business is only ethical obligation. I don't know if Tom's is publicly traded. Is Tom, Tom's publicly traded? Uh, I think up, up until 2017, they weren't. They weren't? Yeah. Okay. Let's see. Let's, let's look and see if it's publicly traded. Um, Milton Friedman would say that's unethical because you're giving away something that you don't really have a right to. You're, you're, you are... Uh, affecting shareholder wealth. Is that a valid argument? No, it's not. Why not? The company's main goal is to make a profit. Uh -huh. They have a structure. Uh, the structure now we're going to achieve that. Tom's uh -huh. a specific one that shareholders knew about but when they're getting into it. I mean, they are giving away issues for every pair of shoes you give them to. Uh -huh. So you're only going to attract that, that demographic of shareholders. Okay. So if the shareholders know what they're buying into, then it's ethical for Oh, so if Tom's had started out by being purely a for-profit company, and then all of a sudden the founder, uh, Blake um, Muskowski, decides he's going to do this, then it wouldn't be ethical. 
that we did without uh, the permission of the, of, his, of the owners, then yes. Okay. Which is, is that, that's more of like a business organization where they have organizational management questions of marketing. Okay. All right. I'll buy that. All right. So just and ethical behavior, lawful. I think those are good, good things that help us on our way to answering this question. Good job. Anything else you all want to add to that? No? All right. All right. So the final presentation is by Erasable, or no, Erasable <laughs> Six, right? Yeah. All right, go ahead. All right, we put justice and fun as acting accordingly and morally right and fair. Okay. Morally right and fair. All right. The first example would be letting other businesses, let's say you buy from the supplier and they have transparency in where they get their supplies, how they're manufactured and how they're delivered. Okay. Transparency in supply chain. Like let's say farmer is organic. It's these are free range chickens and we have proof they're not caged up or anything. They're actually out there free and then have somewhere for them to stay compared to someone that just let's say has the has the animals caged and they're just is pumping it out. Okay. People gotta eat, don't they? So what's wrong with having cooped up chickens? Cooped up chicken sickness. Cooped up chicken sickness. Well, like thing? cooped up chickens and like having basically diseases spreading easier between the chickens. Okay. All right. So you could get avian flu, I guess, um, and that. Although I'm not sure that free range chickens is the is the answer, particularly when you think about yeah, what not free the range that means. Either. What? I wouldn't think that'd be the answer. I think the answer to that would be like more sanitary conditions as well as keeping a close eye on if chickens are actually acting different or they're not, let's say, they're not laying eggs properly or you look at the eggs and their malformations or anything. Okay, all right. So why is that transparency in the supply chain a good thing or, or, or having a lack of transparency, is, is that a bad thing? If the company says, I don't want to reveal my, my process secrets. If I come up with a new way in the supply chain of getting things to so one of the things that Amazon has done and forever and ever and ever, for example, as part of their logistics, Walmart used to, and I have no idea where this broke down or what happened to it, but Walmart used to have, and it was a completely proprietary system for their um, for their stocking to keep track of inventory. They had a very good just in time inventory control, which they would not release. They, they won't tell you what they're, now, I go to Walmart now, it's a horrible experience, and half the time they don't have what I'm looking for, right? I have no idea what happened to their just-in-time inventory control, but it seems to have gone completely off the rails, because half the time I go in, and, and I'm not talking about exotic products that, that they don't have, I use the same kind of underarm deodorant that I've used for 20 years, and half the time they don't have it, and then I'm very upset, because I have to go somewhere else to find, you know, I'm, the, the glory of Walmart was it was a miserable experience, but it was a one-stop miserable experience rather than now I have to have two miserable experiences, right? Because now I've got to go to, to Walgreens or some other equally vapid, horrible store, right, where the Yeti will be in front of me in line and their Yeti children. But um, they didn't have a lot of transparency in that, did they? And one of the reasons that they didn't have any transparency is that 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 edge allowed them to bring goods and services to you at a lower cost because nobody can duplicate it. So is transparency necessarily a good thing? I think it can be good, but as well as like, it could also be not good, especially when you're trying to be competitive compared to UPS or FedEx. One may, like let's say my example, I used to work at FedEx and we had a different system <coughs> instead of like a belt. We had a cage system, so if you missed it, it came back around. So you're not rushing down the line and then 
losing time and getting stuff inside the truck and then having to manage. Uh -huh. Okay. All right. So what's your next example? Another example is uh, uh, not marking up like necessary items to like ridiculously high rates that people need like their necessities. For example, we for ex our example is like uh, Martin Screlly, who uh, upped the prices of a uh, I think it was an HIV medicine medication that people needed to live, and he upped the price up like I think like six hundred times, something ridiculous like that. When he could have easily just not for, like not mark it up as high to the point where people could not afford the medication that they needed. Mm -hmm. So that's how we just thought like that was like just like that wasn't that was injustice and that just would be allowing fair prices for pe people to actually buy, not like ridiculously wealthy people or stuff like that. Okay. So but isn't that I mean the ability to sell things isn't at a markup that you choose, isn't that called free enterprise? Yes. So what's unjust? I mean, if we, I mean, obviously, if the market will bear that cost, then shouldn't we allow the market to decide? In a, in this, in the viewpoint of just like market and profit, yes. But in like the context of justice, I feel like the what the market can hold doesn't equate to what the people actually need. For example. Like what I was saying previously, the people who could not afford the medication, who had to go like get ridiculous amounts of debt just to afford the right to live, which would be a given. Okay. So, do you think healthcare is a right? Yeah. I do. All right. Isn't that a communistic perspective? <laughs> well, yeah. Well, I personally, I believe that like. Healthcare in general should be in like that kind of like uh, social sociable setting where because having competitive prices for medication and things like that just creates that kind of riffraff between um, people who want to profit off of other people who are sick and people who actually want to help people who want them who are in the business so that they can supply them the ability for like people the right to live okay. versus people who are just in it for the money. All right, so I think what you're arguing is that there's a, and I, I agree with you by the way, that there is a market failure in healthcare. Yeah. As a result of uh, prescription drug prices. Yeah. I, I would agree with that. Okay, and your third example. <laughs> okay, and for the third example, we said um, making sure unethical practices such as child labor is not present. A big um, a vendor of this was uh, Nike in the 90s, where a lot of people were in an uproar about the sweatshops and the child labor in like China, India, and things of that nature that these like kids were subjected to that wasn't really known to the people over here. Like when we go to the Nike outlet and stuff like that, we, we just, I bought this hoodie, people like buy items and they, they're just there for the items while there are people in China or India who are making like two, three dollars making that item, but that's that's like what they that's all they can uh, get, and Nike can afford that because they know that it's so much cheaper to outsource their uh, production overseas than rather internally or something where it's more just. Okay, why should we be concerned with just Nike and their their sweatshop? Why should we be concerned with sweatshop labor? What about, I mean, all kinds of other things that people don't think about. Um, diamonds, for example. Yeah, blood diamonds. Yeah, blood diamonds. Uh, why, don't we, why don't we care about that? Because well, I believe we should care about that. And there's just like, there's a lot of stuff that issues with like outsourcing and like how, how production is done so that the companies can maximize the profits, which is like, understandable in a, in a sense, but I don't feel that as just. Okay. Uh, what about chocolate? You all like chocolate? How many of you like chocolate? That's pretty good. <laughs> Most chocolate is produced using almost slave labor. Did you know that? Mm -mm. What about that? Do we, um, do we not have chocolate? 
they did a whole special. Um, it was, uh, let me see if I can find it. Oops, on CNN. Bitter truth behind the chocolate and the Easter baskets. Um, chocolate <laughs> is one of the things that uh, is still produced. It's most chocolate is produced on the west coast of Africa, and they use slave labor. And in one of the videos that they had, they talked about. Um, You want to be the leader of the free world? Just how far will you go to get what you want? When you turn friends into enemies? Since we're talking about ethics, I won't try to see When you break your own rules? Maybe you can change politics, or maybe politics will change you. The race for the White House is on Sunday at 9 on CNN. This report is part of CNN's Freedom Project. It's a commitment to helping end modern day slavery. The bitter truth behind the chocolate in your Easter basket. It is one of the lead stories on CNN's Autocracy website. It's managing editor, Kat Kinsman. She's joining us from New York. So uh, first of all, I mean, it's a lot of people would not suspect that this is happening, that this is taking place. If you're buying chocolate, how do you know whether or not it's actually contributing to child slavery like the little boy we saw there? Well, this is really disturbing and new information to a lot of people, and especially since we're coming up upon Easter, which worldwide is the biggest chocolate buying time of the year, we thought we would come up with a list of tips that people can look at to help guide them towards slavery-free chocolate. The first one would be to go organic. Uh, there's very little chance that any organic chocolate that you're going to buy is going to be made with, with slave labor. The trees are generally in, on the upper coast 25 years old and uh, not grown under organic practices, and they're not planting new ones. So that's a really great route to go. You should start to consider the origin of where your chocolate is coming from. And if you're looking, and because of the Harkin Angle Act, it's a little bit easier to find out the origins of the cocoa that is used in your chocolate. So while it might be coming from, uh, from Asia or from a few other places, it might not be perfect, but it's better than uh, chocolate you're gonna find on from coming from the Ivory Coast. Now, another thing you can do is to look at the labels. Uh, Ethically sourced chocolate is generally going to have a stamp on it that says that it's either a uh, Rainforest Association uh, certified or that it's fair trade certified. So look at the label and empower yourself that way. And uh, actually, one of my favorite routes to go is to really go to the, the local chocolatiers that are springing up all around the country because so many of them uh, have a very direct relationship with the people who are growing the chocolate. And the fewer links in the supply chain, the more accountability there is. And the fewer people who are trying to make a buck off the chain. And they're really working with the farmers directly to get them the best price possible. And, uh, and they're really going to be happy to work with you to develop a taste for this kind of chocolate. And uh, Kat, that's great. I mean, I've got a, a chocolate place in my own neighborhood that just sprung up. So I, I, I know this is pretty popular. Do, do we have a sense of whether or not this chocolate is like the kind of chocolate we grew up with and if it's uh, more or less expensive? 
you know, it may not be exactly like the chocolate you grew up with, but as Kristen Hart from Cacao Atlanta likes to say, one taste and you get it, maybe two tastes. So it might not have quite the butterfat content in it that, that you're used to, or actually, sorry, the, the, uh, the cocoa fat uh, content, but we challenged our uh, eye reporters to come up with recipes that would make people really uh, just sense what was wonderful about this this chocolate. We got everything from sourdough chocolate recipes to chocolate soup to chocolate cookies. People really put their heart and soul into emphasizing what is beautiful about this chocolate. So what you're really looking for is chocolate that is of great quality, but also makes a difference in the quality of people's lives. That's great. Well, that's a delicious combination. <laughs> Thank you. I yeah, appreciate it. So if you want to know about ethically sourced chocolate, how to find it, um, It'll say Rainforest Alliance on it. It's one of the ways that you can know that it's ethically sourced to the chocolate that you get. The other is Utz Good Inside, UTZ. It's a, that's another uh, ethical sourcing of the chocolate. But what about that? Why don't, we, why don't we care so much about that? And you hear a lot about slave labor in the t-shirt or the sweatshirt or the hoodie that you're wearing. We don't hear a lot about it in terms of the chocolate that we're eating. How many of you have had a chocolate bar in the last week? Did you look make sure it was ethically sourced. Did you know that it was probably not ethically sourced? Mm -hmm. you actually, let's, let's look at it and see okay. if it's actually ethically sourced. Uh -oh. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh. How dare you? Oh my you probably didn't know. Why, why is there care about like the slave that labor? Well, it's kind of the thing I thought about when we talk about diamonds is people relate them to a uh, fairy or something that's very sacred to them. Like, oh, I got this necklace for Christmas. It's something they wear every day. Or... We love chocolate. We love chocolate, mm -hmm. right? It does not uh, appear. Does it does not appear that this is. Um, that's good inside a rainforest line. Sorry. That was like bad chocolate. So, uh, yeah, I'm, they, these are hard things to A utilitarian argument could be that we're all happier. You know, there's a, a little bit of suffering makes a lot of people more happy. I mean, you're much more happy that you got that. Uh, for if, if you had to manufacture that in the United States, what did your hoodie cost you? I'm going to guess right around 100 bucks, right? Oh, this was 60. 60 bucks, okay. So I was way off on Morris. <laughs> uh, if it was if it had been you know manufactured by non non-child labor or non-sweatshop conditions, what do you think it would have cost? Yeah, probably it's not Yeah. Right? I mean, so aren't we all happier with, with the current way it works? It isn't like how like like top designer brand on today, like all manufactured by like people. Like, no. like, like they consider that's why they're so pricey because yeah. this is handcrafted. Like handcrafted, yeah. yeah. Everything yeah. is individual. It's all different from one another. Every part of you buys unique, right? And we couldn't all afford that, could we? It would be like enormously expensive to go back to manufacturing clothing in the United States. There are very few people that do it because of the cost. Okay, so we've got good deal. Good job. Anything else you guys want to add? Huh? Uh, I think that's okay. okay. All right. So we've, we've got some good ideas here about ethics being um, some of you talked about the desserts theory, giving people what they deserve. Uh, some of you talked about, you know, being transparent and honest. That seems to be a theme that runs through it. Uh, what else? Um, you know, uh, providing people with um, products that do what they say that they're do that they're that they're going to do. So I think those are all really good ideas. So what are some ethical theories? Um, and I think I talked to you about this last time. Why should we study philosophy in sales and, and marketing? I would argue the highest degree that you can get is a PhD. That's what I have is the PhD. What does PhD stand for? It stands for Doctor of Philosophy. How many philosophy courses do most PhDs have? Zero, right? Because you don't have to have philosophy is about answering questions of knowledge, conduct, and governance. And so what you get is in a doctoral program, you're supposed to contribute to a body of knowledge, and that's the way you get philosophy. That's how you get the doctorate. But in terms of actually understanding philosophical thought, most PhDs have almost zero knowledge of it. Um, I have quite a bit more because I started out in liberal arts, and I started out as a classical letters major. And so 
Um, it's one of the areas that I really like, and it's one of the things that I think a lot about. And I think it's one of those things that it really contributes, if you understand philosophy, to uh, being a better salesperson because it teaches you how to think critically about things. So philosophy as an activity is uh, one that allows us to focus our thoughts and think things through from a very deep perspective, and I think that we should um, we should try to do that. So philosophy answers three great questions that are relevant to all people, all societies, and all academic disciplines. And those three questions are the question of knowledge. What is it I can know and how can I know it? And I think this is particularly relevant for marketers because when we start saying things like, we're going to manufacture this drug and we're going to sell it and it's going to control HIV, what does that mean and how do we know that? From, from, a, from a scientific perspective. This is, this is not easy to do. So let's think about a much simpler example than talking about scientific statistical relevance. Let's talk about just this item here. What is this item here? Table. Table. A platform. Really? Why is it a table? Put stuff on this. Is this a table? It's not a table. But you just told me if you put stuff on it, it's a table. This <laughs> isn't designed to be a table. It's a flat base support. Why is it not a desk? Well, I could be busy. Because a desk is for one person, right? Really? All desks are for one person? Basically, kind of. More than one is with the table. What? Because as long as it holds more than one person, it's a table. What about a partner's desk? You know what a partner's desk is? Mm -hmm. It's made for two people. It's a desk. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, this, these, if we can't just, if we can't agree on what this is, how can we possibly know that we're going to cure HIV? Or, and they have, right? They have um, the second person in the world about a year ago was actually cured from having HIV, not just got to the point where HIV is undetectable, which is what most of the drugs now do. What is that? They, they get you to, um, you're positive but undetectable. What does that mean? There's not enough cells space to be detected. Yeah, there's not, enough, there's not enough viral load in your blood to be detectable. And if you are HIV positive, undetectable, in theory, what does that, what do they say that means? I, I, I'm curious. Not that you're cured. To be cured, you would have, they can find, if, if, if they go into the lymphatic system, they can test that and find HIV in your system. And if you get off the drug, it will come back, right? Or if the drug becomes ineffective for you, uh, it will, it can come back. So you're not cured. What does cured mean? Cured means that you don't have to take any more drugs. And, and we've done this with a, a number of things that were um, very dangerous. So for example, hepatitis C is another extremely dangerous and actually much more communicable disease than HIV actually. And what have they done with hep C? They've now got a cure for hep C, which is what? What is that? Vaccination. It means, well, no, we've had a vaccination for a while, but they've actually, if you have hepatitis C, a vaccine is a prophylactic. It prevents, right? But this this actually cures mm. Hep C, right? The second person to be cured of HIV actually occurred about a, a year ago. And how did they cure them of HIV? Mm. They did a bone marrow transplant. There are a certain percentage of the population that are immune to the HIV virus, they, they, they can't contract HIV. Wow. And they took bone marrow from somebody who is HIV immune and they transplanted it into someone who had HIV and they cured him by doing that. He, become, he then became, it changed his genetics such that it was, I think it was a male, such that they became cured. Now, why don't we just do that with everybody? Well, it's really it's bone. Well, it's very expensive, and bone transplants are are, are they're, they're, they're 
dangerous. They're hard to do. Yeah, not everyone's a match. Uh, they're hard to do. Um, and unless you, the reason that they did it was he had a rare form of cancer. And the way you cure the cancer is by doing a bone marrow transplant. Right? So um, that's, not, that's not a possibility. But that actually is cured. HIV positive undetectable, what they say, and I, I, I guess maybe I'm skeptical of this claim, is that if you reach undetectable, you can't transmit the virus to a partner. But that seems to me to be risky yeah. because the drug can stop working. Right? Now, there are people that have been alive for a long time. Magic Johnson is a prime example of this of one who's lived for a very, very long time being HIV positive. So what is it we can know and how can we know it? What is the correct course of conduct? And what is the best form of governance? These are, these are enormously important questions. And if you take my marketing ethics class, which you have to take if you're a marketing major, uh, we delve into these questions in, in great detail. But needless to say, what you need to know is, you know, there are three great questions that philosophy answers. And they're relevant to sales in that, obviously, governance is important because it tells us what we can and cannot sell or how we can and cannot sell things, right? The FDA tells us what we can, what kinds of advertising we can do for Prevagen and for drugs and for food and things like that. Conduct, moral philosophy is obviously important to ethics and sales, and we need to think about that. So there are three challenges to ethics that you should know and be aware of, and we'll probably stop at this because... I'm running out of time. We're a little bit behind, but I will get caught up since we had the snow day. Um, the three challenges to philosophical ethics are subjectivism. This is a belief that there are no a priori truths. And this seems to be so. If I ask you really difficult questions, much beyond sort of very easy to answer things like, is it ethical for me to throw an eraser? I had a colleague who did this. Her name was Marilyn, Marilyn Orson. Um, and when I was associate general counsel, Beverly was a little elderly lady who, who spoke like mass. Um, Beverly taught English. And if you fell asleep in her class, back in the day when we used to have chalkboards, the erasers for a chalkboard were much heavier than these. If you all have ever remember your classrooms from elementary school, had had these, and kids used to go out. That used to be one of the things that I would always volunteer for. At the at the end of the week, teachers would say, "Has anybody want to volunteer to go up and beat the erasers out?" You know, and and you got out of class basically. You know, 15 minutes early to go out and beat the erasers. I was always one that would do that. So these were these heavy like things, not like this. And if you fell asleep in her class, she would throw an eraser and hit you in the head. She was deadly accurate by the way, with this eraser thing. I mean, she was very, very good at this. And I, I would venture to guess that probably most of you would say that's that's not ethical, right? Like, shouldn't be doing that. That's in fact, there's a law against it. It's called battery, right? Um, the unlawful touching of the person of another without their consent is battery. That's what she's doing. She's touching you by instrumentation, you know, to get you to wake up. Now, it, it was effective in keeping people from falling asleep. You get hit in the head with a racer once or twice, and you don't do that. But if we think about really difficult questions, should we market, for example, abortion is legal as of 1973 in this country in a Supreme Court case called Roe versus Wade, at least within the first trimester. Now, that decision in and of itself is very, from a marketing perspective, an ethical marketing perspective, very problematic, right? Obviously, abortion is a service that providers provide, and that is marketing, right? Well, a lot of people have heartburn with that. But what about the abortion pill? Should we be able to market that? How does the abortion pill work? What does it do? 
It's also called the mor morning after pill. When it was first marketed, it was, it was developed, I think, in France. And it was called RU486 initially. What does it do? Well, if you get pregnant and you take it within the prescribed time period, it causes what's called spontaneous abortion or miscarriage. It forces a shedding of the uterine wall. Is that ethical? You can take it within the first 24 hours. Actually, you can take it within the first several weeks. Well, it could be considered ethical or not ethical, depending on that particular person's situation. Like, if it would be better off for the baby not to be born, like, if it would have been born, like, in a very um, drug-induced household, or if the baby would be harmed, some, it may not even live past its first birthday. Type it's really situation. hard to determine in three days whether or not you're going to have well, something that's going to Well, but if the mother... Like say is homeless, that doesn't have a job. Um, is like all she does is shoot, like do cocaine, does drugs. Um, more than likely, the baby's not going to have a good life. What about traditional birth control? How does traditional birth control work? So there are different types of birth control now, as I understand it, that have been marketed. One type of birth control that's very modern actually stops ovulation, right? But historically, the way birth control worked is it did not stop ovulation, which means that it, it was theoretically, it was possible for you to get pregnant. What it prevented was the implantation of the ovum on the, on the uterine wall. It caused uterine shedding. So technically speaking, traditional birth control may have, or in, in did in many instances, prevent pregnancy, it caused spontaneous abortion. Is that ethical? According to the faith of the Holy See, no. If you're Roman Catholic, to this day, the Holy Father says, you know, the only form of birth control that's allowed by the Holy Roman Catholic Church is, is the rhythm method. Well, that's a horribly ineffective form of birth control. Most Catholics, by the way, don't, don't respect that. But most Catholics are against abortion. You see, these are reasons why subjectivism is so appealing. I'm out of time. We will pick up with this, and we'll get back on track from our snow day uh, next time and hopefully get are caught we, up. No, there will not be a test on Thursday because obviously I haven't finished this stuff yet.